All right, Keychron back in the building today with the Q2. This is the 65% version of the Q1 they debuted last August. So we're losing the dedicated F-Row in exchange for a smaller desk footprint. We've gained a knob and some internal stuff that improves the acoustics and the user experience. If you're watching this video, these should be shipping. Like most Keychron boards, these come in a variety of different configs and price points. We have a bare bones ANSI knob version here today. So no switches and no caps, and it's priced at 159 US. Though be aware the shipping is usually a flat rate of $30 for DHL Express. That's a big surprise to check out. So technically you're looking at 189 out the door before switches and caps. This build is heavy at 1.6 kilos fully built. It's a chunky, utilitarian, brutalist vibe. 6.5 degree typing angle with a front case height of two centimeters. You can still see the lower edge of the switches peeking through. It's not my favorite thing, but it does allow the RGB to pop if you're into that. They also shipped a wrist rest, which normally I wouldn't even discuss, except that this one is poured resin, similar to what you get from an artisan designer. It's exactly the perfect length for a 65 or a 75%, which I love and it's only 30 bucks. These all pour out different. The bottom of this one unfortunately looks better than the top, but if you like a hard rest, it's pretty sick for $30. We have three case colors, gray, blue, and black. This is obviously the knob version, but they are available without as well for 10 bucks less. Included, you get a handful of replacement screws, gaskets, and case feet, as well as a braided USB-C to USB-C cable this time with a USB-A adapter. No attempt at a coiled cable this time around, and I feel like that's a good choice. One of the things I noticed right away is the huge amount of flex on this board. I'm not even pushing that hard here. It's really impressive. Impressive. Aside from that, the other thing that really sticks out are the new stabilizers. They're still screw-ins, but these seem to be Keychron's own design. I don't have any info in terms of material, but they're two-tone green, flat bottom, so no clipping. These are lubed great where the wire meets the housing, and there's minimal lube inside the housing. For users going for their first customer, especially coming over from like a gaming keyboard, these are going to work great. It's all pre-assembled, so you just slap your switches and your caps on and go. More fickle enthusiasts will want to completely re-lube these, and you will need to disassemble the board to do that. So the first thing I did when I got this board on the desk was tap that case really hard because the original Q1 had really bad case ping before modding. Luckily, we don't have that here. Opening the board, we see how they did this. They placed thin silicone dampeners around the top housing, creating some separation between the top and bottom case. So in effect, what they've done here is implemented their own factory version of the force break mod, where people used thin silicone tape to separate the halves on the original Q1. Worth a note too, that future versions of the Q1 also have a knob option as well as these new silicone dampeners. They also redid the connector between the daughter board and the main PCB to be more robust. These are tough ports. There's nothing tricky about them at all. These should stand up to plenty of modding and you don't have to pull the daughter board to access the PCB. So with the plate and PCB assembly out of the case, you can see we've got thick pour-on gaskets, which is where all that flex is coming from. While the case itself is aluminum, the plate is actually steel. Just a few screws to get inside and we see a layer of EVA closed cell foam as a dampener. This is also how you get access to your stabilizers. You can see on the back of the knob that there appears to be a hot swap socket behind it, but it's also soldered to the board to stabilize it. So unfortunately, you won't be hot swapping this knob for a badge or an artisan cap. As for the rest of the PCB, we have Gateron hot swap socket, south facing, five pin with per key RGB. This is also QMK and VIA compatible. The knob is also assignable in here, so you have left, right, and then push in as well. They've also put the reset button in a really easy access area right under the space bar if you ever need it. In the lower case, we have a thin layer of plastic topped with just a thin layer of cheap packing foam for case dampening. Since they included some of the Gateron G Pro Reds that are factory lubed, let's load it up and see what it sounds like stock. Okay, so initial impressions, not bad. It does have a really thin sound, and I think most of that is coming from the switches, but since these are available in the pre-built version, I did want to give these a try. They performed a lot better than what I expect out of a Gat Red. They're really smooth, there's no spring ping at all, no crunch, no leaf ping to speak of, just like a thinner, higher pitch sound overall. If you're just getting started in customs, if you see everything about switches and it just feels really overwhelming, these are probably a really good place to start. We've also got some obvious spacebar rattle there, so we will address that, but the smaller mods actually sound and feel pretty good. The big takeaway here so far is that we don't have any glaring obvious issues with the case. There's no ping. There's not really any hollow sound here. So I'm going to tune the stabs on the space bar. We'll up the ante with some switches and we'll see what we get.
Okay, so the space bar is sounding better with just some basic re-lubing there. It is a clackier sounding board overall, probably not ideally suited for those GAT inks, but I'm really not getting anything negative. You can see in the demos too that the flex of the board is really nice. It's a great typing feel. You can stop right here and be done. It's not doing anything crazy exciting in terms of acoustics, but it's not doing anything bad either. And going without the plate foam, I don't notice a huge difference other than the mods sound a bit more hollow, and it highlights that those smaller mods need to be re-lubed as well. Seeing as how removing the foam doesn't really give us any gains and results, and more work, I would leave this foam in if you're going for a clackier build. Now for the crowd pleaser, we'll run that same setup with a taped PCB and some polyfill and PE foam and see what's good. All right, so that sounds exactly how I expected it to sound. This is obviously the way to go if you're looking for a thawkier build. That is, you want your keyboard to have that lower pitched, softer tone. I actually prefer running without the EVA foam in this setup so that it's not there to mute any of the lower tones. And if there is any hollowness, the other materials that we put in there will take care of that. So that's actually pretty sick that no real config sounds bad. So you can either lean into the clacky nature of the board or set it up to be thawkier. That gives you a lot to play with in terms of experimenting with the sound and switch types. I've had people tell me that the four break or the silicone tape mod is really the only necessary mod on the Q1 and I totally get that now. Using tape and polyfill is if you want to steer the sound a certain way but there's no wrong answers here. You just pick the setup that sounds best to you. The setup is a little firmer with the polyfill. Not shocking as there's not a ton of space down there but it's a steel plate so we're not really giving up flex more so the way the whole key bed moves. The typing experience still feels very comfortable in this config. So at a price of 159 or 189 with shipping it's still pretty hard to not give this thing the go-to for a 65% board if you need an aluminum case, especially if they can do a good job of keeping these in stock regularly, which is something that's becoming more and more important to people looking to get into the hobby. It's built really well. It has all the usual Keychron amenities like Mac support, though there's no wireless on this model. When you add on the shipping cost, it definitely stings. So hopefully they can get localized vendors sorted to help ease some of that. For competition at this price point, I think you're getting more here than you'd get out of like a Tofu 65 kit, definitely more than you'd get out of like a Drop Alt. If you're not married to the idea of an aluminum build, I still think the KB D67 Lite is probably the best entry-level board out there at $109, and they are starting to be stocked more regularly. The most interesting competition for me is probably going to be the Canon Keys Bakaneko 65 or the Zoom 65 from Mellatrix. We'll be checking out both of those very soon. So I realized recently that the body of reviews has really grown on the channel, but having a bunch of disconnected one-off reviews doesn't really help newcomers navigate the content if they're new to the channel or custom keyboards or audio, both of which can be really overwhelming topics. So I've been playing around with building some basic records recommendations or tier lists based on price and application. And unlike video content, I can go back and edit that written content as the market changes so it always stays fresh. The first step to any of that is securing a domain name. And for that, I recommend Hover, the sponsor of today's video. One of the big things I like about Hover is that they focus purely on domain names. That means I have the security of having my domain name separate from my hosting. So as things grow and change over time, I can update my hosting to suit my needs without having to worry about going through an unlock process for my domain. My hosting needs may change over time, but my domain domain name or how people find me online, that's constant and that's valuable. Hover also has over 400 different domain extensions. So if .com feels a little dated to you, you can have .tv or .tech or .live. You can really customize it for your brand. And a big thing having your own domain does for you professionally is it gives you a great looking email. Like you can have Brian at badseedtech.com instead of Brian at whatever huge email company everybody else is using .com. And right now you can save 10% off any of Hover's domain extensions and help support the channel by going to hover.com slash Bad Seed Tech. Big thanks to Hover for continuing to support the channel and thank you so much for your time. Overall, I'm really impressed with the Q2. I like the smaller footprint versus the 75% Q1, but that's purely preference. And I'm always a fan of a brand responding quickly to criticism. They corrected all the issues I pointed out on the Q1 and who doesn't like a knob? Am I right? Great job from Keychron. If you want to check out some more keyboard content, you can do that right here. And if you want to check out the private Discord for Patreon supporters, you can do that right here. That's it for today. Thanks so much for watching, and I will catch you all in the next one. Stay up.